Hello everyone. In this second video of chapter two, time domain analysis of linear system, we discussed in the previous video, the zero input response. In this video, we will cover the impulse response H of T. So let's go there. Now, when we say the impulse response, we represented by H of T, basically, if you have a system and you excite it with an impulse that exists for a very short period of time and you measure the output and the output may look something like this, it may look something like this, then the K to zero. Basically, this H of T tells us the characteristic of the system and it will help us to find the output of the system for any kind of input. Now the advantage of knowing the impulse response for a linear system is the following. If you have an input, let's say like X of T like this one, and it could be very complex input. I can represent this input as a linear sum of these pulses. And if I make Delta T very narrow, it become like an impulse. Now, if I know how the system responds to this pulse and to this and this one and this one, if I sum all these outputs or responses of the system, it would be the response of the system to this complex signal. And that's the advantage of knowing the impulse response of a system. If you think of it in the frequency domain, this impulse has a wide range of frequency components. Literally, if this is the strength of the frequency and this is frequency, it's like this. So it has every frequency component. So that means I am exciting this system with all kinds of frequencies at the same time, and then I absorb the output. If I do the frequency analysis of this output, I will find the different frequency content in this signal. So if that impulse has a thousand hertz and amplitude one these will have also a thousand hertz but the amplitude may be larger may be smaller depend on the nature of the system so with one excitation i am basically testing the system for all kind of frequency components instead of in the lab when you do uh, circuit theory lab you excite the system with 1000 hertz you look at the output how much phase change, how much the amplitude change, then you excited with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, just to draw the frequency response of the system. The impulse will do it with one input. Okay, that's the importance of the impulse response and it tell us the nature of the system. And this is like, I'm not recommending the following, but if you have uh, somebody you met and you wanna test his attitude or his nature, and you take like a needle and you poke him quick, just like an impulse, and see how the person responds. He may get very angry quickly. He may get very angry slowly. He may keep fluctuating, angry, relaxed, wondering what's going on with you. So that instant shock, it tells you how the person behaves. Same thing for the system. You can think of it this way. Okay. Let's see now, how do we derive the impulse response H of T of the system? I will not go over the proof of these steps. There are many videos allocated just for the proof. And in your textbook, at the end of the chapter, you will find the detail of the proof. But basically, the steps to find H of T are the following. You start with any system. That system could be of N order. This is the input. This is the output. And if you make the input here an impulse, then the output here will be impulse response, H of T. And now we need to solve this equation to find the output, which is the impulse response, H of T. In this example that we will do, this is the differential equation that describes the system, and it's of second order. So capital N here is two. So let's just use this notation. This is a polynomial of the variable D of N order. And this is the polynomial of this polynomial equation. And it could be of M order and M usually for a stable system, the maximum it can be is N or less. 
Now to find h of t, I can think of the problem or of this system as two subsystem. So this is the big system, and I will call this subsystem q of d, described by q of d, and this is by p of d. Now this big system, if I excite it with an impulse, then the output here, y of t, will be just the impulse response, h of t. So let's look inside this subsystem. Let's say the output here, it will be the natural response. Let's just call it y of n of t. So the first step is we need to find the natural response for an input of an impulse. So then we will just solve the following equations. Okay, so that impulse only exists at that instant of time. So to find the natural response, y of n of t, we will just solve these differential equations. And the same way we did for the zero input response, so we will solve it just for dn plus a1, dn minus 1, and I will set this zero. That impulse exists only for a short period of time, so it will determine uh, the initial condition of y of n. We did this solution before for the zero input response, and the first step we find lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, the eigenvalues or the characteristic rule. So then the natural response will be just a combination of characteristic modes, c1, e lambda 1, t plus c2 e lambda 2t plus cn e lambda n t. Now to find the constant we need initial conditions. In the zero input response you will be given the initial conditions. It's based on the energy stored in the system. But for the impulse response here all the energy stored in the systems are zero. No initial conditions. That means h of t depend only at this input. So how are we going to find c1 and c2 and cn? For this to be true, this equation to be true, the derivative dn minus 1 of y of n at t equals 0 has to be like a pulse, like a jump, something like this, such that if I take the n derivative, which is this one, then I will get just zero, then an impulse because of this sudden jump, then that's just a constant, so that's zero. So I will get this impulse. So this impulse will be coming from here. So this condition has to be met if this is true. So then this will be just dn of the natural response at t equals zero will be just the impulse. So then these equations will be satisfied. All lower derivative like dn minus 2 and all lower derivative should equal 0, should, should, should not have a jump. Then it will have another impulse. That means dn minus 2 phi 0, that's 0. The n, n minus 2 derivative and all lower derivative. dn minus 3 y 0 should be 0 all the way to zero derivative, which is just zero. So this initial condition has to be met. And this one means n minus one is the only one that will be one, equal one. So that's what this statement here. So after you find the natural response, which is a sum of the characteristic modes, then the initial conditions you use for this impulse input will be this only this derivative will equal 1, which is n minus 1. In this example, n is 2, so only the first derivative of n at t equals 0 will be 1. All lower derivative will be 0. If that n was 3, then the second derivative at t equals 0 will be 1. The first derivative will be 0, y 0 will be 0. And these are the initial condition you will be using to solve for c1, c2, cn. All right, so we found y of n. Now y of n will go to this subsystem, which is described by p of d. 
and give you the final answer here, which is h of t. So whatever u of n you found here with solving the constant, this subsystem will carry the operation on this one. For example, in this example, p of d is this. That is the derivative of y of n of t plus 3 time y of n of t. That will give you h of t. And that's the solution. And we have u of t here to indicate this answer only for t equals 0 and after. Because the excitation here happened at t equals 0. There is no output before that. The only special case is the following. What if m equal n? So maybe this is a third order system and this is a third order system. Then we need to include B0 time the impulse response, that addition. We have to include it for this special case, if M equal N. Let's go through an example to demonstrate these four steps and see what's the output for this system. Let me clean up. Okay, let's do this example. We have a second order system and we need to find the impulse response h of t. That means, again, the input is an impulse, the output y of t is a special case, we call it the impulse response h of t. So my q of d will be this one, and my p of d will be this one. So the first step is to find the characteristic equation. So we replace d squared by lambda squared plus 3 lambda plus 2 equals 0. And then I need to find the characteristic roots. So this will be lambda plus 2 time lambda plus 1 equal 0, lambda 1 equal minus 2, lambda 2 equal minus 1. And the natural response will be C1 e minus 2t plus C2 e minus t. And now we need to use the initial condition due to the impulse excitation and this will be the condition we will be using so the only derivative of the natural response that will equal 1 is n minus 1 in my case here n equal 2 so n minus 1 is 1 so the first derivative at t equals 0 equal 1 all lower derivative will equal 0 so I will use these initial conditions to find c1 and c2 so let's take the derivative first of the natural response. That's minus 2c1 e minus 2t. So now if I use these initial conditions, I plug for t0 and this equal 1. Now if I use this initial condition, I plug for t0 here. So that would be c1 plus c2 and this equals 0. Now I can solve these two equations. This is equation 1 equation 2 to solve for c1 and c2 so i'll just say equation 1 plus equation 2 and i will get here minus c1 equal 1 so c1 equal minus 1 and c2 will equal 1 by plugging here okay so the natural response is c1 which is minus e minus 2t plus c2 1 e minus t that's the natural response now this natural response will go to this subsystem. So h of t will go to d plus 3 natural response. And this is the first derivative of this. So that will be 2 e minus 2 t minus e minus t plus 3 times this natural response. So multiply 3 times here. It will be plus 3 minus e minus 2 t plus e minus t. And if I simplify this equation, I will get minus e minus 2t plus 2 e minus t. And make sure you multiply by the unit step function u of t to indicate these only exist for t equals 0 or after because the excitation of the system happened at t equals 0. And that's how we find the impulse response. So we start with the differential equation. We find the characteristic equation, we find the characteristic roots, we find the natural response, which is a combination of the characteristic mode. We, un we use these conditions, which is these. And we solve for C1, C2, 
and then we take this natural response to this subsystem p of d in this case is this one so that's a derivative of natural response plus amplification of the natural response by three which is this one and that's the impulse response of a system and this basically describes the system you will have here the characteristic root and how they interact minus one plus two with each other now what if I give you the same system except it looks like this? How is it going to change from this solution? Well, the first step, n equal to m equal to. So m and n are equal. So I have to include in the solution b0, which is these two, that's b0, impulse t plus this component and now this component is 2 times the second derivative of this the natural response will be the same since nothing changed here but you will do the second derivative the subsystem consists of a second derivative plus 3 so then it will be second derivative it will be minus 4 e minus 2 t plus second derivative of this one plus e minus t plus 3 times y and the natural response times this and that's how the answer would change so if you have m and n are equal you just add this component b0 here in this case is 2 b0 here is 2 so i can replace this by 2 and then this subsystem is different than this one it has second derivative now we always say zero input response and the impulse response when we derive them we assume the coefficient here is one if i give you the problem like this and they ask you find the zero input response or the impulse response make sure to divide this equation by three so the coefficient for the highest derivative is always one so that would be d squared plus d plus two thirds all right, we cover here all possibility and in deriving the impulse response h of t and we will see later on the importance of the impulse response when we study the zero state response. That means the system response to any kind of input. If you know the impulse response of the system, then the output is very simple. Just you take the convolution of x of t with h of t. This will be the talk for the next video where we will cover the zero state response of a system and system stability. Thank you very much and talk to you soon. Goodbye.